This panel discussion that you're about to hear is part of the Federalist Society's broader Freedom of Thought project. And if this strikes your fancy or any other uh, of these topics that uh, we've heard today, um, log on to that on the Federalist Society website and you can learn more about the Freedom of Thought project. And now for critical race theory in K-12 public schools. Public K-12 schools across the country have introduced elements, at least elements, of critical race theory into their curriculums. Biden administration has produced a federal rule that would prioritize funding for history and civics programs shaped by CRT. And if memory serves, that rule uh, was a reversal of the rule from the Trump administration, which had prohibited the use of federally uh, federal funded uh, uh, agencies like school districts to uh, instruct on critical race theory. A number of lawmakers across the country in many states have introduced or passed legislation seeking to limit the teaching of critical race theory. And we have given you as part of the program materials for this panel discussion, uh, a multi-page document which summarizes about uh, one and a half dozen such bills that are pending in this legislature as we speak. And we've also provided uh, a, a copy of another bill which it didn't get enacted, but it's, uh, it's uh, widely regarded as being sort of a model for these kinds of bills from North Carolina. That is also in the materials that have been circulated and they're available on uh, the website for this panel discussion. And you should have uh, received copy to, copies of them by email. Uh, and then parents across the country have pushed back against school boards, boards adopting CRT. Um, that, of course, was, happened in Loudoun County, Loudoun County and was much involved in the gubernatorial race in Pennsylvania. And uh, we've had uh, uh, parental uprisings of sorts occur here in Missouri as well, in particular involving the Rockwood School District in St. Louis County. Uh, and in addition to uh, outcries by uh, dissatisfied parents at board meetings, litigation has been filed to this effect. And uh, in this regard, you have in your materials copies of the complaints that Kim, I'm soon going to introduce her and the others, um, has filed two of them, one against the Springfield, Missouri School District and another against the uh, Skokie, Evanston School District in Illinois. If anybody tells you that, oh, CRT is not being taught in public schools, just send them a copy of one of Kim's complaints. It will thoroughly refute that notion. So what is critical race theory? We're going to, you're going to hear from a, a professor from St. Louis University who teaches critical race theory, or elements of it, uh, at uh, the undergraduate school at St. Louis University. And uh, among the questions that are going to be raised and discussed by this panel are states and localities within their rights in designing and limiting curricula and what can or cannot be taught in public schools? Or do those kinds of laws potentially violate First Amendment rights or other applicable law? I think you're going to hear some competing views regarding those issues from members of this very fine panel. Before I introduce them, the format will be each of them will speak for about 10 minutes, making their opening presentation. I will then give each of them an opportunity to respond to something that one of their fellow panelists may have said. Uh, I will ask a, a few questions, I do believe, and then uh, it will be opened up for Q&A from you all. Reverend Michael Barber is a professor of philosophy at St. Louis University, and uh, he has been serving in that capacity for 37 years. He is an ordained Catholic priest and is a, a Jesuit. Uh, he holds his doctorate in philosophy from Yale University, 
at St. Louis University, in addition to teaching there for many years, he has served as Dean of the College of Philosophy and Letters, and he has served as Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences. His resume, by the way, as the resumes of all of our panelists, are below their pictures on the website. You just click on them and you can see their full resumes. They are all, they're fairly lengthy and very impressive. Father Mike has published seven solo authored books. He has edited 19 books and he has published over 100 articles. He has served in leadership roles in several international uh, organizations dealing with philosophy and in particular his uh, subset of interest which is phenomenology. Regularly teaches courses in ethics, philosophy of religion, and philosophy and race, including the philosophical texts that are classified by their authors as part of the generalized critical race theory. He celebrates mass weekly in Spanish for the Hispanic community of Holy Rosary Church in Fairmont City, Illinois. Uh, included in the materials are an article that he recently published in the St. Louis Post-Dispatch uh, a month or two ago, and um, in it um, he offers some views about uh, the teaching of critical race theory or elements of it in K-12 public schools. That's not his field, as he will disclaim when he uh, speaks to you, um, but uh, he has concerns that if CRT is taken out of the university context and brought into a school involving young children that care must be taken uh, in not causing children to feel guilt or otherwise have negative reactions to what might be heard from the tenets of critical race theory. Not a lawyer, and uh, I've asked him to put on his professor's hat when he speaks uh, with you, and uh, which he will do uh, in just a moment. I'm, I'm uh, identifying the speakers in the order that they will speak. So Father Mike will go first, then followed by Josh Hammer. Josh is the opinion editor of Newsweek, or an opinion editor of Newsweek, a research fellow of the Edmund Burke Foundation, and he is a syndicated columnist. He is a frequent pundit and essayist on political, legal, and cultural issues, and is an, a constitutional attorney by training and he co-hosts two podcasts. He's very outspoken conservative, and he deals with everything involving the intersections of law, politics, and culture. He has been published in numerous of the leading uh, uh, publications in this country and elsewhere. He's also had his legal scholarship uh, published in the Harvard Journal of Law and Public Policy and in the University of St. Thomas Law Journal. He is a, sp a frequent speaker at Federalist Society events, and I first met him when he was on a panel in November at the uh, Federalist Society National Lawyers Convention in Washington, D.C. Kim was also on that uh, same panel with him, and we're pleased to have them both here in Missouri. He's a graduate of Duke University and from the University of Chicago School of Law. In your materials, you also have a link to his article uh, in the New York Post. And I think we will hear from him strong advocacy for two positions. One, that critical race theory is dead wrong, both as a matter of historical fact and law. I'm, uh, he'll have to speak for himself, but let's see if, how close I am in describing his views. And secondly, it should be banned in the K-12 public schools. Tim Herman. Uh, serves as general counsel for the Southeastern Legal Foundation, a national nonprofit legal organization that is dedicated to defending liberty and rebuilding the American Republic. She advances liberty through litigation in federal and state trial and appellate courts on issues ranging from individual liberty, government out overreach, free speech, property rights, and economic freedom. She's an active member of the Federalist Society, and she serves as an expert on the Federalist Society's regulatory transparency project. Um, as I mentioned, she has uh, prepared those two lawsuit complaints, and uh, she will tell us about what is in them. 
Uh, and she has also provided us uh, that summary of the various pending bills uh, in the Missouri legislature, and we'll have some observations about some of them. Dave Rowland, next to Father Mike, is Director of Litigation and is co-founder of the Freedom Center of Missouri. Uh, he, he attended Abilene Christian University uh, before studying law and religion at Vanderbilt University where he received his law degree and a master's in theology. Uh, he has worked in the nation's, in various places, including in Washington, D.C. as an attorney with the Institute of Justice, where he litigated school choice, economic liberty, and property rights cases in state and federal courts. His uh, work has been discussed in uh, leading publications as well, such as the Wall Street Journal, the New York Times, Washington Post, USA Today, the Huffington Post on Fox News, and MSNBC as well. Uh, since moving to Missouri in 2007, he has been a frequent presence on television, news broadcasts, radio shows, and in newspapers across the state. He uh, travels widely throughout the state and spe speaks uh, uh, about education, property rights, health care reform, constitutional protections for liberty, and the American founder's conception of virtue. He is also a regular at our FedSoc events. Happy to have him here today as well. He is a preeminent election attorney in Missouri. Of course, we know Chuck Hatfield is one too. Uh, Dave Rowland is one as well. Um, he has served as an attorney and policy analyst for the Show Me Institute, and uh, he's from Mexico, Missouri. Uh, I think we'll hear from David that he has sort of mixed or maybe nuanced views about critical race theory and thinks it might be appropriate that it be presented to children in K-12 schools in certain contexts and in certain respects. Uh, as a, a true libertarian, that's the way I characterize him, uh, he generally would oppose litigation that would ban uh, the teaching of CRT. As I mentioned, he's a regular at our FedSoc events and I look forward to hearing from him as well as from the other three panelists he sits with. So now, Father Mike, now Father Mike, he left his written notes in his car, but he thinks he can r capture it from his uh, laptop computer, so uh, good luck with that, Father Mike. The floor is yours, and uh, you have a lecture hall full of students in front of you. Okay, well, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Brimmer, and thank you for all of you for inviting me. I think the reason I left my notes back in the car is because I was watching a football game last night. <laughs> As part of the effort to help St. Louis U's African American students feel included and to promote reflection on issues of race that have been, have been and are significant for our university and our city, I have offered regularly a course in philosophy and race. Over the past several years, I have been using the Oxford University Press Handbook of Philosophy and Race. The fact that that press, one of the most prestigious in the world, has devoted a handbook to the topic indicates that it is significant and important. Several of the authors in the text are identified as offering critical race theory, though originally the idea of critical race theory appeared in law with the work of Derrick Bell from Harvard and other authors. I take critical in philosophy to mean that we do not take common sense ideas of race for granted, but that we subject them to examination in line with Socrates and Plato's statement in the Apology that the unexamined life is not worth living. I should preface my comments by acknowledging that I am not an expert in law or in education administration or educational psychology. Consequently, I'm not in a position to say how the kinds of issues we discuss in my course might be carried on in high school and primary education. I will limit my presentation to what goes on in my philosophy and race class and talk about two important philosophers that I always use. The Oxford text covers a variety of questions by distinguished authors, men and women, whites and blacks, philosophers of Latino and Asian backgrounds. These authors represent a pluralism of philosophical perspectives, Sartreanism, existentialism, pragmatism, phenomenology, American philosophy, continental philosophy, Michel Foucault, and we cover a number of significant issues and debates. My students are required to show fairness and accuracy in understanding texts, and yet to demonstrate their own autonomous critical acumen in assessing the positions we consider. I expect them to philosophize for themselves. To give you a flavor of the issues that we discuss in the class and that are constitutive of critical race theory as transposed into philosophy, I thought I might rehearse a few of them for you. 
We begin by considering the history of Western philosophy raising questions about its own suppositions. There are horrible things that Hegel, Hume, and Kant, for instance, said about African peoples, crudely attributing properties to them merely because they were black. In the 17th and 18th centuries, several political philosophers developed the social contract theory to justify obedience to law by contending that at some level all of us have freely and autonomously entered into a contract with fellow citizens so that the laws we obey follow from our free contractual assent. However, philosopher Charles Mills points out that these contract theorists at the same time failed to consider the large numbers of human beings who had been deprived of their freedom, political and otherwise, within the institution of slavery. Mills rightly points to such omissions, and he points out similar omissions in the thought of John Rawls. But he really does not impugn contract theory itself, since he actually believes that its moral imperatives should have been much more widely extended, and an account should have been taken of the many who had been denied their freedom. The contract theorists, in a sense, did not take seriously enough their own norm what their own normative imperatives entail. Another issue we consider is the biological basis for race. I prefer a very minimalist notion of race, such as that of biologist philosopher Michael Hardiman, who posits visible physical features, ancestry, and geographical origins, origins as constitutive of certain population clusters, very vague general claims. Hardiman, along with virtually all the authors in our text, insists that the possession of the racial features characterizing black people can indicate nothing about their mental, psychological, or moral character, and that there is no racial essence of black people. Because of this, I argued in my post-dispatch piece that it is equally wrong to claim that there is a white racial essence, as if whites were inherently racist or hateful. The literature on race and philosophy is full of criticisms against racial essentialism of any kind. But if one gives up biological essentialism regarding races, is it necessary to abandon the idea of racial identity? There are, for instance, debates about racial identity between Jean-Paul Sartre and France Fanon, between Anthony Appiah and Lucius Outlaw over the heritage of W.E.B. Du Bois, and between Lewis Gordon and the Afro-pessimists, to name a few. Eliminativists oppose any biological conception of race, like the early Apia and Naomi Zak, but the later Apia talks about developing positive, but not tightly constricted racial scripts, and Zak focuses on the significance of mixed race. Jason Hill, a cosmopolitan thinker, even thinks that it is immoral to adopt a racial identity at all. Cornell West suggests that being black means mentally being part of a community that has suffered abuse and degradation, and yet one that has a rich culture and history of struggling for justice. Such a defin definition refuses to define being black in terms of victimhood, but affords hope to those who become familiar with the history of that struggle. This history to which West points is inspirational, as my students, both black and white, discover. And indeed, the struggle was not simply about black people alone, insofar as they were accompanied by brave white abolitionists and civil rights workers. As I suggest in the Post-Dispatch, any of those who become acquainted with this history could emerge with hope and concern for others and not guilt and despair. We also consider a variety of concrete issues discussed by social scientists and legal experts on topics such as white privilege, health disparities, incarceration, reparations, race, and equal protection, the equal protection law, and the interaction between race and gender, including positions from both the feminist and masculinist sides of the debate. So that's what goes on in my course. It's a, a pretty sprawling kind of course, I think. Um, no, I'd just like to, I'd like to mention that I situate all of these discussions of race within the context of two re recent philosophical theorists. Alfred Schutz, a Jewish philosopher refugee to the United States from Austria under Hitler's Anschluss, is most helpful for illuminating the difficulties and limits involved in understanding another person or culture. For instance, Schutz argues that we use classification systems, language, patterns of acting and relating that we inherit from our different social groups, that we mobilize and activate automatically, often without deliberation or reflection, and that are modified within the temporal unfolding of our lives. This unfolding of our stream of consciousness is such that to understand others as they understand themselves, I would have to go through all the experiences the other went through in the order in which the other went through them with the same intensity, which means I can never understand others exactly as they understand themselves. 
Furthermore, it may be easier to understand another in the face-to-face -face relationship with the other's body accessible to me so that I can correct myself by attending to the other's expressions, gestures, and immediate interventions. It is much more difficult, though, to understand another with whom I, I may have never met or from whom I live at a distance with the result that I can only know them through the construction of a type, something like a sociological type like Max Weber's construction of the Protestant. Schutz, too, dwelled on what Charles Horton Cooley called the looking glass effect, namely that I not only interpret another, but I interpret how another is interpreting me. Members of in-groups and out-groups engage in this interlocking of glances, this thousand-faceted mirroring of each other repeatedly, and consequently, it is quite easy to fail to appreciate another's point of view. I find it extremely valuable to see how the epistemological idea of understanding another plays out in interracial relationships, how tenuous it is, how prone to misunderstanding we and I can be. But this is the epistemological side, and I'll just conclude by talking about the ethical side. Another Jewish philosopher I use, Emmanuel Levinas, who lost family in the Holocaust and whose work is considered a post-Holocaust ethics, developed a phenomenological account of how, in the face-to-face -face with the other, I find myself summoned to responsibility to and for the other. This responsibility has nothing to do with guilt, since the responsibility does not arise from me, whether I've done anything right or wrong. That's not the issue. It emerges from the other in the way the man beaten up by the side of the road summons the Good Samaritan to take responsibility for him. This summon appears when I encounter someone asking for money on the street, for instance, when I suddenly find myself put into a position where I have to decide what to do, what to say, how to react to this person. I, I become accountable in that moment. Levinas does, does not tell us what we should do, but he attempts to describe the moment of the encounter. For instance, I may find myself unwilling to contribute any money, but at the least I can say respectfully, I'm sorry, sir, I do not have anything. And that respectful response reflects the call to be responsive coming from the other. Even if one is on the verge of inflicting violence on another, Levinas says that the other, stronger than murder, already resists us in his face, is his face, is the primordial expression, is the first word, you shall not commit murder. For loving us, we experience this summons to responsibility, particularly in relationship to excluded others, to the stranger, the widow, and the orphan in the Jewish law, symbols of all those neglected, left out, or vulnerable. In addition, for loving us, when faced with any interlocutor, I am summoned to listen, to learn, and to respond. Finally, self-absorption and guilt is not the point of Levinas' ethics. The other invites me out of myself and frees me from narcissism as a vulnerable child converts parents into powerful actors on behalf of their child without paying any heed to themselves. Hence, in the post-dispatch piece, I say that if education about the past history of this country leaves one mired in narcissistic guilt and self-focused, it has missed the point. A sense of responsibility and caring for others focused outside ourselves ought to displace the paralysis of guilt for loving us. And several authors in the, authors in the Oxford Handbook insist upon this same point too. Loving us is not only focused on the dyadic relationship, but also analyzes the political domain that arises out of my responsibilities to many others. And there is a never fully resolvable tension between the domain of politics and policy and my experience of the other who continually calls me into question. I cannot explain Levinas's views on the political right now, but referring to Hobbes and Dostoevsky, Levinas argues it is not without importance to know if the egalitarian and just state in which man is fulfilled and which is to be set up, and especially to be maintained, proceeds from a war of all against all, or from the irreducible responsibility of the one for all. I am happy that I base my course in the views of Schutz about epistemic difficulties of understanding another, and Levinas' view of our ethical responsibility to another, to those suffering and vulnerable, as well as to those interlocutors who disagree with us. I am fully aware that discussions of race are volatile on every side and run the risk of interlocutors concealing their violence beneath a veneer of moral righteousness, as Nietzsche argued. My hope is that Schutz and Levinas offer us alternatives, which make the discourse we carry on in my class possible and respectful, and which, in my view, would be good for our society itself way beyond the boundaries of philosophy. Thank you. Josh, your remarks? Can everyone hear me? OK, good. All right, yeah, I prefer to do this seated. So thank you so much for, um, for the opportunity to be here. Um, 
I'm spending two nights in Missouri is the most time I've ever spent here, actually, which is, uh, which be, you all have a beautiful state capital, seriously. I've been to a lot of these. This is, I'd say, on the higher end of the bell curve as far as they come, just like the artwork, the, the, it's really quite impressive. Um, on a personal note, though, I pleasantly surprised, I think, my good friend Michael Lanahan at dinner last night. I told him that I have a bit of family history here, actually. So my great-grandparents, actually, way back in Lithuania, it's over 100 years ago, 120, 130 years ago, great-great-grandparents moved from Lithuania to St. Louis because my great-great-grandfather, who I never met, was told back in the old country that he could find a Jewish minion in St. Louis. So um, I have a bit of a family history here, so it's great to be here and talk to y'all. Um, so I guess before getting into critical race theory a little bit here, I, I think it's interesting the timing of this panel. The Supreme Court, as the lawyers here for sure know by now, of course, granted cert just this morning in the affirmative action cases uh, with respect to the race conscious admissions policies, to use kind of the PC terminology, um, aka the state sanctioned racism um, that is at pl in place at Harvard University and the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. Um, as a Duke alum, I take particular joy in seeing UNC uh, on the chopping block here, but you know, we'll hold that, hold that aside, I guess. Um, it, you know, it really does kind of tee up this discussion, and I think it kind of frames the way that our discussion today should proceed, because affirmative action really is the last remaining vestige of state-sanctioned racism in America. That is pure and simple what affirmative action is. Um, I am certainly hoping the Supreme Court does the right thing. I'm unusually optimistic they will, actually. This is one area, I'm usually kind of like a Jeremiah, I'm usually kind of a prophet of lamentation and all things Article Three related, but on this particular issue, I, I actually am quite bullish. It's really kind of the one issue, of course, where even the Chief Justice said that the way to end discrimination on the basis of race is to stop discriminating on the basis of race. So I, I, I said, we, if we take that line and we kind of take that notion, I guess, quite simply, I would apply that to our discussion today as well here. Um, there's no reason whatsoever why the exact same spirit that applies for affirmative action should not equally apply for K through 12 public education in the context of critical race theory. But we're gonna get into that a little bit more here. But I, I guess let's frame it in a, like a slightly broader 35,000 foot altitude level to start. We're talking here specifically about public K through 12 education, okay? I think that is what this panel is, is focusing on here. What is the purpose? What is the telos, if we want to try and sound like academic and you know, uh, philosophical, if we want to kind of uh, get our Aristotle in? What is, the, what is the telos of public education in America? Well, look, I guess some kind of Enlightenment liberals, some kind of like more libertarian folks, left-leaning and right-leaning liberals, might say that it is to kind of you know, expose the next generation to kind of a, you know, a Voltaire-esque, uh, John Stuart Mill-esque, marketplace of ideas and like, you know, in, in, in the long run, well, you know, John Cain says in the long run we're all dead, but I guess the, the liberals will say like in the long run the good ideas will prevail. I guess I submit to you that this is not the purpose of public education in America whatsoever. The purpose of public education in America is to maintain and foster the necessary conditions that will give rise to Tocquevillian, lowercase r, Republican virtue virtue and citizenship and pride in nationhood, pride in place, and the will and the desire to, to continue this wonderful experiment in ordered liberty from one generation to the next. That is the purpose of, or, or th that is the government's ostensible reason for being involved in, in, in education. Query, hold aside whether or not the government even should be involved, obviously, that's a school choice debate, it's a slightly ancillary debate, maybe Q&A, but not the focus of our remarks today. But that really is kind of the, the purpose of education, public education, K through 12 in particular. So seen through that lens, you know, critical race theory is deeply toxic. It is poisonous, it is manifestly and obviously self-evidently contrary and counterproductive to the telos that I just espoused here. Partially, of course, because it's just in large part revisionist history and a lie. I mean, the 1619 Project, obviously, Nicole Hannah-Jones's uh, handiwork, uh, not exactly a, a, an accurate portrayal of history, I guess would be the polite way to say it. I mean, it's gotten panned pretty badly from everyone, from, from Gordon Brown or, um, uh, what is his last name? Sorry, um, the Brown University historian. I'm blanking. Uh, Gordon Smith is that his name? But uh, every uh, everyone, center left and right, has just totally panned Nicole Hannah Jones's revisionist view of history here. But 
it's not just that the history is bad. I mean, look at what they're, they're actually saying here. So I- Ibram X. Kendi, who everyone, everyone here I'm sure has, has heard of, he actually says this in his infamous book, How to Be an Anti- Anti-Racist. I mean, arguably the most influential critical race theory proponent in the entire country. Quote, the only remedy to racist discrimination is anti-racist discrimination. The only remedy to past discrimination is present discrimination. The only remedy to present discrimination is future discrimination. I mean, whiskey tango foxtrot, guys. Like, is this America? Like, is this a place where the 14th Amendment, where the notion of equality that Jefferson so eloquently wrote? I mean, I saw a TJ statue outside this Capitol building when I walked in today. You know, I'm born Abraham Lincoln's birthday, a man who was quite familiar with Jefferson's writings and worshipped the Declaration of Independence. If we actually believe in that animating principle, if we believe that all men are created equal, why in God's name are we even purporting to entertain the legitimacy of a pseudo-fraud of an academic who is out here saying that we should be discriminating on the basis of race? This is lunacy. I mean, the 14th Amendment obviously codified that, that notion into our constitutional fabric, so it, it obviously, you know, it's no longer just 1776 where it's kind of an abstract principle. It is literally part of our constitutional DNA. There's a robust 14th Amendment case law on this. And look, just to kind of hammer home the previous point as well, the notion that a public school classroom is a marketplace of ideas is utterly insane. So I come from a family of teachers. So my great grandmother, who was the one who was born here in St. Louis actually, ultimately became a special education teacher. My grandmother, her daughter, was a special education teacher. And my mother is in the final year of her 20 to 21 year stretch as a third grade public school teacher. She's retiring after this year. She's very excited for that. But the notion that what they are doing in the classroom is an enlightenment liberal marketplace of ideas, is, this is an insane proposition. I don't know how else to say it here. First of all, we know from Economics 101 that resources are scarce, okay? That is kind of like one of the most fundamental of all fundamental insights of the dismal science of economics. Teachers necessarily have limited and finite resources, and they have to make decisions about what they can and cannot teach here. I mean, are we going to seriously submit that we should teach Holocaust denial alongside World War II history? I mean, is that what kind of the don't ban critical race theory crowd would purport to espouse? We should actually be teaching Holocaust denial? I mean, these same people who are telling us that we can't ban critical race theory have now been telling us for decades and decades that we can't even talk about genesis. We, take, we can't talk about intelligence design, the creation story. I mean, all of that apparently is totally verboten, right? So they're, they're okay trying to ban some things. Then when it comes to their dedicated faux revisionist history, overtly racist claptrap, they're telling us that we can't ban it. So they really have to kind of choose one as well. Also, I, I, from a slightly more legal perspective, the First Amendment argument here I think is simply risable. The First Amendment does not in any way protect a public school teacher's Voltaire-esque absolutist right to free speech. The First Amendment exists to protect us from the government. Here, that means protecting the students from the government functionaries, the mandarins, the government actors who are themselves the public school teachers. So it completely reverses the causal chain of how the First Amendment operates, I think, on on, on a very basic level here. So at a slightly higher level, he, 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 here's really what's going on here. And they give away the game, obviously, when they, when they do the kind of two-step dance that I just described, when they say that, like, we want to ban kind of intelligent design, and I'm, that's just a good example. I mean, there's no reason that we have to stick with that, but it's just a good example. But when they talk about the imperative to kind of ban things like that, but then we can't ban critical race theory here, they're giving away the game. And the game is that they have a fundamental, substantive view of what they view as the good, the true, and the beautiful. They are putting out their vision out there. They are put, they, their vision happens to be manifestly not good, not true, and not beautiful, but it nonetheless is their idiosyncratic conception of that. And they are unapologetically putting it, they are forthrightly submitting it, that we should then inculcate the next generation in those values here. And at a higher level, at a conceptual level, I guess kind of the weak and effete defense that I hear from, you know, uh, I, you know I guess like David French as kind of right liberals, where like you can't ban any of this stuff, is they're, they're giving away to the conceit of liberalism. So I'm going to actually read here. Um, so Adrian Vermeule, you know, um, the Harvard Law professor, who's among the many hats he wears, has been, has been writing at this new post-liberal order substack. And he had a great post just a couple weeks ago. The post is called, Who Decides? 
And he's quoting here Justice Harlan's um, opinion from the 1887 case, Muggler versus Kansas. Those of you who remember um, your con law, it's a Muggler is a case where the court basically is asked to decide whether the Kansas state legislature can, uh, to simplify matters, um, whether they can simply ban, quote unquote, intoxicating liquors, like full stop. And the court says basically yes. So here's what Justice Harlan writes. He says, quote, Power to determine such questions so as to bind all must exist somewhere, else society will be at the mercy of the few, who regarding only their own appetites or passions may be willing to imperil the peace and security of the many, provided only they are permitted to do as they please. So if you're, if you're listening carefully, that is directly applicable to what we are talking here. To not regulate, to not ban prudentially, to not ban this manifestly counterproductive and f frankly just evil, racist nonsense, to not ban it is not to just say like marketplace of ideas, is to functionally delegate that decision, is to functionally delegate that decision in lowercase r Republican self-governance from the legislative body to the teachers on the spot who can then do exactly what Justice Harlan says they can do, imperil the peace and security of the many provided only they are permitted to do as they please. So at kind of a conceptual level, this is kind of the conceit of liberalism and the fact that I think all conservatives don't manifestly understand this is a failure of kind of what we think conservatism is. This is kind of getting into a broader point that I make all the time about how conservatism needs to get more comfortable actually wielding power to pursue its own vision of the true, the good, and the beautiful, kind of getting at that telos of what education is and preserving the nation state and all of that here. So look, at the end of the day, this really is kind of a regime level battle. It is a battle of various conceptions of the common good. It's about who we are as a people and who we will be as a nation state. And you know, like obviously, like there are gonna be various kind of specific policy initiatives. Some laws will be, will be, will be better than others. Some will have better lawyering. Uh, my very good friend Max Eden, who's a research fellow at the American Enterprise Institute, has put out some good language um, uh, about what a good kind of critical race theory ban could look like. Uh, I think that was uh, uh, based on the Idaho language, and North Carolina one is promising. But look, uh, the policy devil will always be in the details. But at a higher level here, um, I, I think it is nonsense to pretend like we cannot and should not ban critical race theory because we absolutely should. Kim, your remarks, please. Am I close enough? Can you all hear? Okay. Um, thank you for that, Josh. And <clears throat> giving a general introduction to kind of what critical race theory is, what I want to talk about is how it's actually being implemented in the schools and give you guys examples um, from our lawsuits. So take a quick step back from that. We all know, as lawyers here, we all went to law school, we know that the government cannot discriminate or treat people differently because of the color of their skin. The government cannot compel individuals to believe things that they don't believe in or to say things that they don't want to say. That's Con Law 101. That's exactly what our schools are doing across this country to both teachers and to students. What they're doing is they are implementing race-based programming instead of traditional education, and they are doing this in the name of equity. What they mean by equity is very different than the word equality. Right, they're conditioning individuals, in this case kids, as young as four years old, to see only skin color. They are pitting racial groups against each other, and they are putting each one of those kids into a category and a hierarchy of racial privilege. They are telling them, if you are white, you are privileged. If you are black, you are oppressed. End story, there is no in between. This is totalitarian tyranny. It is not the democratic republic that we are all here wanting to uphold and to make sure still stands when our kids are sitting in these seats down the road. That's the bad news. The good news is that parents have had enough. I'm one of them. I have a four and a seven year old, so this fight is very, very close to my heart and it's very personal. We have parents across the country that have been calling us for over a year giving us stories, telling us stories, asking us to represent them, asking us to help them fight back. And they are correct when they recoil from the terms like equity and anti-racism. They've got the FBI, the Attorney General, the NSBA, the NEA all against them. If you think that they're not actually investigating these parents who are speaking up at school board meetings, you are very mistaken. We have parents calling us with, because the FBI is calling them. 
They make a comment at the school board, and all of a sudden, they have an investigation opened up into them, a criminal investigation by the FBI under the Patriot Act. This is real, and it's happening. So let me give you some examples from two of the lawsuits that we have filed to date. The first one we filed in June of last year on behalf of a teacher in Evanston, Illinois. The teacher actually filed a complaint in 2019, long before this was a kitchen table discussion. She filed a complaint with the Office of Civil Rights with the Department of Education because her school district, District 65, was segregating students and teachers. We're not talking about your voluntary affinity groups where people might want to have, you know, an Asian American uh, student organization or a black student organization. We are talking about you're in an actual Zoom teacher training and they put the white teachers in one breakout Zoom and the non-teachers in another breakout Zoom. And then they teach them different lessons. Right, and so typically the idea there, and in this particular one, it was about race, and it was about how white people are privileged, and our country is, at its core, a white supremacist country. Okay, that is mandatory segregation. The Department of Ed went through an 18-month investigation and did ultimately find that the district was violating Title VI of the Civil Rights Act because they were treating people differently because of the color of their skin. Unfortunately, several days after Biden took office, the Department of Education withdrew that letter of finding in an unprecedented manner. I have spoken with people who have worked at the Office of Civil Rights dating, I mean, back into the mid-90s. We have tried to find another case where this has happened. We cannot. Okay, there was no explanation whatsoever. They just let the district get off scot-free. And so she decided to file this lawsuit. A few other things that are happening in that district. Um, and all of this is public. Evanston is proud of implementing critical race theory into their curriculum, and so their curriculum can actually be found on their website. If you want to see their Black Lives Matter Week lesson plans, you can see every single one of them in the PowerPoints. Right? Some of the things that they have the kids do are make and take anti-racist pledges. This is not an optional exercise. They read a book that you've probably all seen on Twitter called Not My Idea, Book About Whiteness, we put several pages of it in our complaint. Um, visuals are really important, as we all know as lawyers. Um, and they've gone viral on Twitter. And this is a book where a young child is trying to convince her mother that white people are bad, that they kill black people, and that they don't get punished for it. This is not hyperbole. You can read the book for yourself. In the back of the book, there's an activity page with a white person dressed as a devil holding up a contract that binds you to whiteness where you get to mess endlessly with the lives of your neighbors, your loved ones, and all fellow humans of color. Kids are then asked to sign it. Okay, how unbelievably damaging is that to a child? Not only, it's not, it'd be wrong to have an adult do that, let alone a four or five year old child, and that's happening in pre-K classes. Here in Missouri, we filed a lawsuit on behalf of teachers who were required to take an anti-racist training. It's been filed against the Springfield Public School District. Um, and again, this is not a, a First Amendment case about what can be said in the classroom. As Josh pointed out, this is, very, this is very different. This is about them having to take a training in which they were required to identify themselves on an oppression matrix, which identified colorblindness as a form of white supremacy. It also stated that the, that the slogan MAGA, Make American Great Again, is a white supremacy slogan. They were required to point out on this where they belong based solely on their skin color and then talk about it. Another exercise that they had to do was, and coincidentally, some of this was on Zoom, but they had to go pick up signs, actual pieces of paper that said agree or disagree. And they had to hold up the sign to a prompt, and I actually have them written down to make sure I don't get these wrong. These are all detailed in our complaint. Things like parents are the oppressors of their children. Parents oppress their children when they raise their children to vote a certain way. Educators have a duty to vote for socialist politicians. Educators have a duty to make sure students understand socialism is a good thing. White people are oppressors. By showing pride in America's history, staff, so the teachers, should think about who they are harming. Think about that last one. 
You're showing pride in our country, and you're being told that you're harming children. They had to hold up whether they agreed or disagreed to these, and they were told that if you disagree, you will be seen as being disrespectful, and so to don't do it. And one of them was publicly reprimanded for doing so. That is a violation of the First Amendment. That is compelled speech, and that's why we have filed that lawsuit. You know, no official can prescribe what, or should, ah, I can't even talk. No official can prescribe what shall be orthodox. But when you're actually looking at equity curriculum and you're looking at critical race theory as it's being implemented in just these few examples that I gave you, that is exactly what they are doing. They are indoctrinating our children. We are not talking about a college class where you're talking about race and exploring what that means. What we should be doing, as, per the, as Father said, is teaching people to look at who a full individual is. That is the complete opposite of what is happening in these classrooms. And when they're doing that, they are violating Title VI, they're violating an Equal Protection Clause, they're probably violating your state Hatch Act, your state teacher ethics, and in a lot of states, including here in Missouri, the Attorney General has a lot of authority to enforce those laws, and so what we need to see are we need to see more private attorneys helping out parents and educating them on what their rights are and helping them actually file some of these complaints. Help a parent file an ethics complaint. Help a parent file a privacy law complaint. It doesn't take much time. It's great pro bono work for you guys to get in because um, we can't handle all of it. We're a staff of four, right? We can only bring so many of these cases. And so I just really encourage everyone in this room to get involved in this. And if you need help and guidance, groups like ours, Alliance Defending Freedom, um, you know, I'm trying to think who else is bringing these. Uh, Liberty Justice Center, there's, there's a number of our groups that are bringing these. We're here to help you. So that's my plea for help um, and just to give you an idea of what the cases look like. Dave. I'm very excited to have the opportunity to share my thoughts on this topic. Uh, it, it's a topic that uh, I have spent a lot of my life and career thinking about. Um, I grew up in the state of Alabama where we were surrounded uh, by people who felt very, very strongly on one side or another about uh, this nation's history uh, and the implications and meanings and future for this nation. Um, and, and so I was fortunate enough to have the experience from a very young age of being exposed to contrasting ideas. When I was in school, it was never just one perspective. It was never just, you know, this is the only correct way of looking at this historical issue. It was always a balance. There was the kind of what I would consider the traditional story where we talk about uh, the pilgrims showing up at Plymouth Rock, about them being greeted by smiling Native Americans and they all got along very well and then we just kind of skipped over everything until we got to the American Revolution. Uh, but so much of the story, the traditional story of American history um, focused on kind of the European experience in North America. Um, I was also fortunate that that wasn't all that we got when I was growing up. We learned a lot about the Native American societies because North Alabama had a, a lot of Native American influence prior to the arrival of, uh, of uh, Andrew Jackson, frankly. Uh, and uh, we learned all about those Native cultures, went and visited the historical sites of those cultures, and learned about what happened to those cultures once Andrew Jackson arrived and won the Battle of Horseshoe Bend uh, and then ultimately uh, became president and uh, instigated the Trail of Tears. Um, and so not just in that context, but, but with a number of different historical narratives, um, I was fortunate as a, a student in public schools um, to be afforded these competing perspectives. On the one hand, a story of American exceptionalism and the brilliant opportunity and promise that Americans enjoy as a result of the constitutional structure 
that uh, has been handed down to us, but on the other hand, a very clear understanding of the ways that our nation historically has not lived up to the grand ideals of those who founded this nation. Um, I found that to be greatly enriching, having those perspectives, uh, even when I was in elementary school. When I went to college and law school, I started to encounter the ideas of critical race theory. Uh, I studied uh, race and the law under Dr. Robert Belton um, at Vanderbilt University. We read out of Derrick Bell's book, Race, Racism, and the American Law. Uh, Derrick Bell is one of the leading lights of critical race theory. Um, and I found it very interesting, not necessarily persuasive uh, in, in all of the arguments that Derrick Bell and the other authors brought to bear, uh, but, but it was fascinating to be exposed to these ideas that were contrary to my preconceived notions, right? And in my mind, that's what education is. Education is not just the accumulation of knowledge, particularly if it's knowledge only offered from one particular perspective, but rather the opportunity to learn how to think critically. And that requires challenge, it requires competing perspectives so that the student learns to distinguish what they believe to be accurate and what they do not. And you can't develop that skill if you are not exposed to these competing ideas. So I found it incredibly valuable and enriching in my time at Vanderbilt and, and to a limited extent even at Abilene Christian um, to have been pushed by my professors to engage with these ideas that were not part of the traditional narrative so that when push came to shove and it was time to begin my career as a full-throated libertarian public interest attorney who loves the United States Constitution more than almost anything in the world, I could also recognize that the values and the virtues that are embodied in our founding documents and the Declaration of Liberty have not always been the values and the virtues that we as a nation have espoused, and there have been consequences for that. So as I was taught it, the animating concept behind critical race theory is that when we look at American society today, there are still, in spite of decades, of civil rights laws and efforts to reform our legal structure, there are still very clear racial disparities in our society. And critical race theory, number one, tries to highlight the fact of these disparities and then to try and figure out why is it that these disparities continue to persist and what, if anything, can be done to try and erode those disparities. Now, there are Clearly, certain critical race scholars who take a more aggressive approach, they take the standpoint that basically white people are evil and inherently racist. I happen to think that that is a, mi a minority of at least the, the scholars that I've read. Uh, and so I think that it would be um, almost falling victim to the very thing we're complaining about to caricature all of the people who write from this perspective as though they share you know, that particular extreme viewpoint. Um, that's the background. I now wanna to cut to what I think is really the heart of this particular issue when it comes to critical race theory in K through 12 education. And to get there, I wanna start by uh, reading a little bit from uh, a speech, very famous speech by Learned Hand. Many of you have probably heard it before, the Spirit of Liberty speech that Judge Learned Hand uh, gave more than a century ago now. He said, the spirit of liberty is the spirit which is not too sure that it's right. The spirit of liberty is the spirit which seeks to understand the mind of other men and women the spirit of liberty is the spirit which weighs their interests alongside its own without bias. The spirit of liberty remembers that not even a sparrow falls to earth unheeded. The spirit of him who near 2,000 years ago taught mankind that lesson that he has never learned but never quite forgotten, that there may be a kingdom where the least shall be heard and considered 
side by side with the greatest. I am a libertarian, I am a Christian, and that speech speaks to me. It speaks to me that I can't always assume that my perspective or the perspective of any, of any particular majority that may exist out there is correct and should be trusted to bind the will and the actions of people who may disagree with those perspectives. And particularly as a Christian, I need to understand that when there are people who are outside of the mainstream, perhaps who have not had the advantages that many have had in society, we need to make sure that we are not tuning them out, but rather that we are seeking to understand and to take account of their perspectives. To close, uh, I want to counter, respectfully, with a different Supreme Court opinion, one of the Supreme Court opinions that inspired me to get into constitutional law and do the work that I do, West Virginia versus Barnett, uh, which I believe is one of the great U.S. Supreme Court decisions in history. If you don't recall, it involved compulsory salutes of the American flag. Um, the Supreme Court had just two years before that decided a case called Minersville versus Gabitis, where they upheld um, making mandatory for students to salute the American flag. Uh, a couple years later, almost identical set of facts gets back in front of the Supreme Court and it comes out with a different conclusion. And I want to read just a couple of excerpts from this case because I think it gets to this, the central problem when we're talking about public schools. Justice Jackson said, free public education, if faithful to the idea of secular instruction and political neutrality, will not be partisan or en enemy of any class, creed, party, or faction. If it's to impose any ideological discipline, however, each party or denomination must seek to control or failing that to weaken the influence of the educational system. That they are educating the young for citizenship is reason for scrupulous protection of constitutional freedoms of the individual if we are not to strangle the free mind at its source and to teach youth to discount important principles of our government as mere platitudes. The Gabitis opinion, this one that immediately preceded West Virginia versus Barnett, reasoned that national unity is the basis of national security and hence reaches the conclusion that compulsory measures toward national unity are constitutional. As governmental pressure towards unity becomes greater, so strife becomes more bitter as to whose unity it shall be. Probably no deeper division of our people could proceed from any provocation than from finding it necessary to choose what doctrine and whose program public educational officials shall compel youth to unite in embracing. Those who begin coercive elimination of dissent soon find themselves eliminating dissenters. Compulsory unification of opinion achieves only the unanimity of the graveyard. If there is any fixed star in our constitutional constellation, it's that no official, high or petty, can prescribe what shall be orthodox in politics, nationalism, religion, or other matters of opinion or force citizens to confess by word or act their faith therein. If there are any circumstances which permit an exception, they do not now occur to us. Ladies and gentlemen, the problem is coercion. The problem is that any perspective, whether it be a conservative perspective or whether it be a left-leaning perspective, takes upon itself that it gets to be compulsory, that it gets to set the sole terms of debate for our school children. That's the problem, not whether it's critical race theory or whether it's a more traditional perspective. It's the idea that the government gets to decide what the official narrative is. And with that. Thank you, Dave. Thank you all. Would anybody like to respond at this point to what anybody else has said? Okay, then I have a question. I'm, I'm interested uh, in, the, in the issue whether there should be a state law to regulate or ban or in any way to address the teaching of elements of uh, CRT in K-12 public schools. Uh, I'm going to ask two questions about that. And the first one has to do with what the content is of what would be banned. And I think it's important to be very specific 
as to what it is we're thinking of banning if, if we are a legislator of a mind to do that. And I'm going to read from that North Carolina House bill that is in your materials. So this is what it said. These are examples of what it says can't be done. And it starts out by saying public school units shall not promote, shall not promote, and then it lists a number of things. I'm going to read off about six of them real quick. And my question is going to be, what's the harm in saying these shall not be promoted? Here they are. That an individual solely by virtue of his or her race or sex is inherently racist, sexist, or oppressive. An individual should be discriminated against or receive adverse treatment solely or partly because of his or her race or sex. An individual's moral character is necessarily determined by his or her race or sex. An individual solely by virtue of his or her race or sex bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same race or sex. An individual solely by the virtue of his or her race or sex should feel discomfort, guilt, anguish, or any other form of psychological distress. And then finally, in these examples, that a meritocracy is inherently racist or sexist. Shouldn't those things be banned? What's the harm in having a law that says school districts can't do this? I'll jump in there. Um, so, I think the, the first observation that I have is that um, that, strictly speaking, is not critical race theory. I mean, I think that most people would say um, it, it's perfectly fine to, to uh, teach that bigotry is a, a bad thing and, and we want to discourage uh, anyone involved in public education from promoting bigotry in any way. I think, I think that that, as far as it goes, is fine. Um, the problem that I have more generally is with so many of these bills, it doesn't stop at saying, you know, bigotry is a value that we will not espouse and that we will seek to root out. Um, they go directly to specific materials and they say, we are going to consider, for example, the 1619 Project or certain other written materials to be verboten. Uh, you, you know, you're not allowed to teach from these things, you're not allowed to do that, or you're not allowed to uh, teach from a certain perspective. That's where I think you get into the problem of um, you know, book banning. And, and that I think most people in this room, I hope, would agree is, is a terrible thing. Um, historically, it's gone very, very poorly. Um, and in particular, the U.S. Supreme Court has said you can't do this. Um, so, so I think that once we get beyond a simple statement that, you know, we won't tolerate bigotry, uh, which again is something I think pretty much everyone can get on board with, um, I think then you start to get into the problem of, well, when you're dictating what can and cannot be discussed, then, then you've got constitutional problems. Thank you, Dave. I'll, I'll weigh in to just kind of counter a little bit of, of what my good friend Dave and we, we actually litigate several cases together, not on this topic, um, but we are, we are good friends. But I, I disagree with the initial statement that this isn't critical race theory. It might not be critical race theory in the context of learning it in, in college, and admittedly, I did not take those classes. I'm an accountant originally by trade, so that, that was my undergrad. Um, but it is how it's being implemented in our schools, right? That is exactly what the teachers are doing, right? They are not the people who took these classes in college. They did not take philosophy of race. They did not take critical race theory classes on the large part. They are doing exactly what the NEA is telling them to do, what the NSBA is telling them to do, and it is to just bring race as a major topic into these classrooms, and a four-year-old cannot even begin to comprehend what critical race theory means. When you tell them that the number one thing that you should be looking at in a person is the color of their skin, that's all that they understand. They're four years old. Okay, this, I mean, it really borders on child abuse in the sense of indoctrinating them to hate each other. 
That is what's happening in the schools. Now, in terms of the bills, some have good things, some have bad things, but at the end of the day, we have civil rights laws. We have teacher ethics rules that say you cannot discriminate against your students. You should not be able to teach them then to discriminate against one another. It's just, it's morally wrong. Teach them to look at the inside of a person. And so, you know, I, going down that list of them, but I, I do counter the fact that th this is how they are implementing critical race theory into the schools. The teachers might not realize it, but those that are pulling the strings at the very top, they know exactly what they're doing. Yeah, I mean, I don't have a whole lot to add. I mean, I defer to Kim on like the definition of how critical race theory is being implemented. She has much more on the ground experience. I, I guess the only thing that I'll add to that is I, I have no philosophical objection whatsoever to using the powers of public policy in the state to affirmatively ban books from public school curricula. I mean, I, 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 if I were a legislator, I would file a bill tomorrow to ban Mein Kampf from public K-12 through that has not been done already. That strikes me as just totally common sense. Father Mike, go ahead. Yeah, one of the things I was thinking about is uh, I don't disagree with any of those things mentioned. They sound quite reasonable. The problem that strikes me is the things that Kimberly talks about, which I think are just horrendous. It does strike me, I mean, there's a real ethical vocation that a person has as an educator. And it strikes me when you start manipulating and dominating people, even in, and at a very tender age, it's even more bad. I think it was worse, actually, at that level. And, that, and then, so I'm not sure even if you have this law in place. Can you stop? The, I mean, there's really a need for people to be trained as teachers to be respectful of the people they're teaching. Thank you. Thank you. All. Yeah, go ahead, Dave. One additional thought that I'm not sure if it's going to be controversial for this crowd, but um, I, I think that a very important element that's been missing in all this conversation is the feeling uh, of many parents that they are simply stuck with whatever is being taught at their school. They, they feel these debates so keenly because um, if they don't get their, their preferred perspective out there or if they don't shut down these perspectives that they don't like, um, then their kid's just going to be stuck with it. And I toss out an idea that's been circulating for quite a long time. Um, give parents the opportunities and the wherewithal to take their kids to schools that are going to teach ideas that are in line with what the parents want. Uh, I think that's the solution. Rather than trying to impose top-down, passing laws, dictating what may and may not be taught in schools, give parents the opportunity to get their kids to a school that will teach lessons that are in line with the parents' senti uh, sentiments and, and ideas. It's just a thought. Let me answer my second question about how to frame a bill, and it sort of latches on a bit, Dave, to what you just said. So this kind of bill would be one that doesn't address the content of what is being taught in the K-12 public schools. It provides uh, procedures and remedies and uh, uh, rights to know to help the parents in these contexts. And uh, don't hold me to this language. This is not right out of a statute. For example, though, a provision that the school district must publicly disclose all of the teaching materials, have them available for anybody who wants to drill down and see exactly what is or is not going to be taught, uh, that you can't require training of children on certain topics, maybe absent parental consent. Uh, another one, uh, that parents uh, would have the right to object to the, something being so taught, uh, that is to be taught, as they've seen from the website. They know this is going to be taught, that they have a right and a procedural mechanism by which they can object to that. There's a ruling made on that by various tribunals, whether the board or Department of Elementary or Secondary Education or maybe some other kind of review, but that there be uh, a, a, an avenue for parents to voice their objection and have that it be adjudicated in a, a less than a full lawsuit situation. Uh, another one, give parents a right to opt out if they see that rather than just objecting to something, they just say, you can go ahead and do that, but I, want, I do not want my child to be subjected to that. Uh, another possibility uh, uh, is require, this is sort of like parents' bill of rights stuff, and some of these statutes are called parents' bills of rights, uh, and that there be full transparency regarding all the communications that the teachers are having with that parent's child, because there's some secrecy about that that has been complained about. What do you all think of a statute 
that does that kind of stuff. I can weigh in first. I've, I've looked at a lot of these. Um, I think that there's provisions, like in every, anything, there's provisions that are good and there's provisions that are bad. I think that anytime we're adding additional layers of regulation on something, I'm not normally a fan of that. And this is just um, you know, me speaking. Uh, SLF is a C3, so not lobbying one way or the other for bills. But um, I, I do have some concerns about that. Right? I don't think that we can be opting out of every single lesson in every single class. I think it would turn into an absolute disaster as to how the, the classrooms are administered. I, I just don't think it's practical. Um, I do think that we need opt-ins for things like surveys. Um, there's major privacy law issues going on with the surveys that are issued across the country. Um, there's one that is being used largely across this state in, I believe it's ninth grade uh, social studies, may have been English, where the students actually take a quiz online and then the result goes to the teacher as to whether it comes out that they're a Republican or a Democrat. And they're, tr I mean, th this stuff's being tracked, right? The surveys have been, been being used since, since Clinton came into office and it, it, they track everyone long term. If you think there's not files on everyone in this room, there, there are. Um, at least from those of us who were in school in the 90s when it started. Um, so I think that we need those in them, but I, I do have some concerns about the practical realities about some of the other issues in Parents' Bill of Rights. However, we do need to let parents know that they have rights. A lot of the things that are in those, they're already codified into law. We just need to let parents know so that they can actually enforce them. We've got about five minutes left. Does anybody have anything more they'd like to add on that topic and you're dying to say it? If so, you may. Otherwise, I want to open it up to questions from the audience. Go ahead, Dave. Just to sum up what my friend Kim said, I think that boils down to pro-transparency, anti-bureaucracy. You got it. <laughs> okay. Uh, questions from the audience. The microphones that are aimed up are the ones that work. This is directed to each of you or maybe just the father, but rather than promoting one nation under God, doesn't CRT tend to resegregate our population? Uh, that's a good question. Yeah, I mean, I, I um, at least the way I'm teaching it in my course, I don't find that happening. I mean, I find it's really uh, because it's 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 framed in a, it's put in a framework of let's talk about this together, right? And with respect for mutual interlock. Huh? Hey, pardon? At the college level. Yeah, if it's done the way Kimberly is talking about, sure, it's going to be divisive, and you're going to kids will. Yeah, I mean, they'll, they'll grow up with hatred for the rest of their lives. Yeah, I mean, I don't, it doesn't strike me that's a very good way of of achieving. I don't, but there may be ways of doing this in a grade school. I mean, to talk about history with kids, and 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 not in a way of laying guilt on them, and not in a way of you know, but trying to promote community with each other in a way. I don't know how to do that. I, like I said at the beginning, I'm not an educational psychologist. Go ahead, Dave. Thank you, Father. Uh, I'm just going to rely directly on Justice Jackson. Again, this is, this is from West Virginia versus Barnett. We apply the limitations of the Constitution with no fear that freedom to be intellectually and spiritually diverse or even contrary will disintegrate the social organization. To believe that patriotism will not flourish if patriotic ceremonies are voluntary and spontaneous instead of a compulsory routine is to make an unflattering estimate of the appeal of our institutions to free minds. Freedom to differ is not limited to things that do not matter much. That would be a mere shadow of freedom. The test of its substance is the right to differ as to things that touch the heart of the existing order. Perhaps focusing on critical race theory could provide for additional fissures in society. That's possible. It's not a reason to set aside constitutional values in informing or rather demanding conformity of, of opinion or teaching. It is segregating students. Um, we're seeing it in schools. I, I gave you examples from two school districts. I mean, these parents, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, you name it, they're in my DMs nonstop sending me examples, pictures. Um, we can't even begin to field all of the, the questions that we get. 
And there's many other groups, Moms for Liberty, Parents Defending Education, No Left Turn. They're getting just as many, if not more, uh, questions that we're getting. This is in every school, and they are segregating the students. And um, it, it is a real problem. It's, it's not just a cultural war like everyone wants to say it is. This is a true war on our Constitution and the way that we uh, operate as a country and on our governmental structure, and that's the intent, is to undermine that. Read their books. It says it straight up in there. Maybe not as much the original theorist. However, I, I would probably disagree with that, too. Um, but it's out there, and that's the goal. The goal is to undermine our constitutional republic. Josh? Yeah, I mean, real quick, the answer is obviously yes. Um, it violates the animating telos of the American regime, as defined in, in the Declaration, the Reconstruction Amendments, the 14th Amendment in particular. Um, so the answer is very simply yes. Um, I, I'll just quickly add, I think my new friend is going to really hate me for this. Um, I, I think Barnett versus West Virginia is a horrible case and is totally wrongly decided. Um, it literally reads like Anthony Kennedy opening the fortune cookie. I mean, like, like this is kind of just like sophistic nonsense, I think. But um, that's, a, that's my idiosyncratic opinion. Oh, one more question. Will, far away. Yeah, well, let me take things back for a second here. So the the... Missouri State Board of Education recently granted uh, full, accredi full accreditation status to Kansas City Public Schools for the first time in a while. And I actually went to Desi's website and pulled the data on Kansas City Public Schools. And I believe that's a majority minority uh, school district. So they spend $16,749 per pupil. They have a 62.5% attendance rate. 8.9% of students are proficient in math, only 173 are proficient in English language arts. Isn't the answer just to shut down all of this political education, all of this ancillary stuff, <laughs> until kids are getting like the fundaments of a basic education? I mean, shouldn't that be where our efforts and focus are? I mean, that's the driver of inequality in society, is a lack of a, a functional public education system in the places that need it most. I think there was a question in there. I could be wrong. I'm sorry. An excellent topic for another panel discussion. Thank you, Will. Uh, we are at the, uh, we have a hard stop at this time. I want to thank this panel. I think this has been absolutely marvelous, and it shows what a big tent the Federalist Society is. We have, even have disagreements among ourselves. Thank you all very much. <laughs>